So we are talking uh, about membranes, and we're talking about the fluid mosaic model, discussing the fluid part. And we basically have to maintain the membrane at a specific fluidity. Uh, part of the way that we can do that is by regulating how far the lipid molecules are from each other by changing the number of um, saturated and unsaturated fatty acids at the tail. The other thing that we can do is we can add in cholesterol molecules. So cholesterol can be embedded into the membrane. And what cholesterol will do is it actually will hold the lipids. It secures the lipids so that they're in the right distance apart. It doesn't allow them to go too far apart to become too liquid. And it doesn't allow them to pack too tightly together to become too solid. So at body temperature, when we have cholesterol embedded or large amounts of cholesterol embedded, it prevents unwanted movement of the lipids within the membrane. And the way that this uh, works out, the consequence of preventing that movement or reducing the movement, if we maintain the space between our phospholipids, which I'm just going to abbreviate as PL. If we drop temperature and we don't embed cholesterol, the membrane would begin to solidify because temperature would cause all those things to pack tighter and tighter together and become more like we see with butter. That's phospholipid. So if we allow the membrane to go into a solidified state, or what I'm going to just refer to as a solid state, phospholipids are going to be packed tightly together. And the overall consequence for a membrane that is in that more solid state rather than kind of that middle range fluid state is for a decrease in permeability. And when we decrease the permeability and solidify the membrane, we have a consequence of decreased protein function. Both of those are going to be bad things. That means that we have a reduced ability to move things across the membrane. We're also now going to have a reduced ability to respond to a lot of so that's the fluid part. Really, the fluid part of the fluid mosaic model is just simply that the membrane is maintained in a range of fluidity where it optimizes permeability and protein function. So sort of shifting gears here to the other part of this model. What exactly is the mosaic? First of all, anyone know what a mosaic is? It's an art term, right? And usually it's kind of a collection of a bunch of different stuff. You display that and you say, okay, that's a mosaic. The mosaic part of the fluid mosaic model of the membrane is really a reference to all of the different types of proteins and carbohydrates that are incorporated into the protein. So the lipids, or I'm sorry, the membrane rather can be considered a mosaic because you have a bunch of stuff displayed in the membrane. Incorporated in that membrane, you have these proteins. And you can see in this figure here that proteins end up occurring in two different ways, either completely within or partially within the membrane or associated with one of the surfaces of the membranes. When the proteins are completely incorporated within or partially within the membrane, those are called integral proteins. So 
those integral proteins will be within the membrane. And they can go all the way across, or they can just be incorporated within the membrane and not permeate all the way through. The other kind, which is right here on this figure, um, kind of at the surface or the periphery, these are going to be peripheral proteins. So these are on the membrane rather than be inside of the membrane. And peripheral proteins can occur both on the inner face or the outer face of the membrane. So there are going to be proteins that are present, and those proteins are a bunch of different types. And so it provides this mosaic of proteins that are associated with the membrane. But in addition to that, we can also have carbohydrates that are attached to the proteins or even attached to some of the lipids. When they're attached to the proteins, we call those uh, glycoproteins. When the lipid is what has the um, carbohydrate moieties attached, we call that a uh, glycolipid. And that's just a reference that we have these attached carbohydrates. Collectively, this causes the outer phase. We don't ever really have those sugar moieties uh, on the inside, the inner face of the membrane. It's typically only on the outside. And it creates this fuzzy appearance to the outside of the membrane. And that fuzzy appearance is referred to as the glycocalyx. So this glycocalyx is sort of that fuzzy coat of carbohydrates on the outer face of the membrane. Uh, and these are really, or the glycocalyx is really for recognition. And you are already somewhat familiar with some of these glycoproteins that we may find rather than <coughs> membranes. Um, how many of you know your blood type? Okay, so you're probably at least familiar with the idea of a blood type. And what is going on here is that blood type, each of us has a specific blood type. You are O, I'm A negative. So we have a different blood type. So our cells will be recognized differently because of the sugars. It's a reference to the sugar. You just don't have any of the sugars. You can either have A, B, or none of them will go A to B. You have none of your O, you have A, you just have the A sugar that is on the surface of the red blood cells with the red blood cells. Those are part of this glycocalyx, and there's actually hundreds of other ways that you can look at um, uh, the glycocalyx and those uh, recognition fingerprints that are on the surface of each of our cells. And it's really for immune system uh, function, primarily. If you have a foreign invading, let's say, a microorganism or a bacteria, it has a different fuzzy coat that's different than your fuzzy coat, and your immune system recognizes that and says that cell doesn't belong here. Right, so the carbohydrates that are attached, and again, when they're attached to a protein, we call them glycoproteins. And really, the glycoprotein, this chain, it's on the figure, it says a side chain, sugar side chain. You could call that an oligosaccharide, and it's covalently bonded to the protein. So that oligosaccharide is covalently bonded to, the, to a protein. We call that protein a glycoprotein. When the same thing happens to a lipid, we call them glycolipids, just simply having that oligosaccharide covalently bonded to the lipids. All right. So what is exactly a membrane? A 
okay, it's a bilayer. And really, it's a, it's a barrier. It's separating the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. Just like this wall is a barrier that separates the hallway from the classroom. So we're trying to separate those two different fluid components inside of the cell versus outside of the cell. But we don't want it to be even permeable. In other words, we don't want stuff to not be able to come across. So we want it to be permeable. Well, skin is actually going to be a tissue. It could be classified as a membrane because it's heavy or blocking, um, but we typically just consider it a pair. When we talk about membranes, we're usually talking about what is around the cell or what's around organ out. But the point is that since we want it to be permeable and not impermeable, we just want to select what crosses at specific times, we have to transport things across that barrier. And one of the main uh, functions of a membrane is membrane transport, moving stuff into and out of the cell. And there's a couple different ways in which we can perform membrane transport. So what you're seeing here in this figure, you have the intracellular fluid, that's the inside of the cell, on this side of the membrane, and then the extracellular fluid here, kind of in that bluish color, on the outside. Incorporated within that membrane, you have a variety of different transport proteins and chains that allow things to cross through the membrane. So really, our definition of membrane transport, to put it as simple as possible, membrane transport is stuff crossing the membrane. So in other words, what mechanisms does the biological system have to move molecules from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid and vice versa first back into the back into this one? And there are a bunch of different types of transport mechanisms. I'm going to start with a form called passive transport. So passive transport, it's called passive because it doesn't require any sort of energy. So energy is not required. In other words, what don't I need? What molecules? I don't need any ATP. I still am going to need something that drives the transport. And what I'm going to use is called a concentration gradient. So the stuff that I'm going to move through this mechanism known as passive transport, that stuff goes down the concentration gradient. In other words, if I go across a barrier, cell membrane, I'm going to draw that as those two lines, Passive transport, I'm going to have a whole bunch of stuff and not as much. And so I have more stuff on one side of the, me of the membrane, less stuff on the other. This favors movement down the concentration gradient, meaning going from high concentration to low concentration. Just like a waterfall goes from a higher elevation to a lower elevation, water pulls down its gravitational gradient, molecules are going to be pulled down their concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration. Now, when we move things down uh, their concentration gradient, if we have, so let me, let me draw a different, uh, can everybody see the red? So I have five molecules on one side, five molecules on the other.
there's really no concentration gradient here, right? So does that mean that those red molecules are not going to be crossing the membrane? They actually still are going to cross the membrane. Because what we have is that random Brownian movement where molecules are randomly moving around all of the time. In these molecules, they're moving all over the place, and sometimes they bump into the membrane, and when they bump into the membrane, they can go across. So even though there's no concentration gradient, we're still going to have movement where molecules are crossing the membrane. But in this situation, they're going to occur in equal frequency, crossing in equal frequency in both directions. And so they sort of balance in and out that becomes equal, and we call that a dynamic equilibrium. Over here in this example, we do have a concentration gradient. Don't take this as being that we only have molecular movement in one direction. We still have that dynamic equilibrium at play. And so molecules are actually going to be moving back in this direction as well. However, just by the sheer number of molecules on this side, if I were to sort of illustrate this graphically, I could draw a much larger arrow indicating that there is more movement from our high concentration point to our low concentration point. But I don't want you to mistake that with that there's not any movement back in this direction. We actually will occasionally have a molecule that goes back in that direction, but there's many more coming in because of the concentration gradient. Okay, so let's talk about some of the types of what's called passive transport. The first type of passive transport is called simple diffusion. Simple diffusion. Simple diffusion, which is the example that's shown on this side of the figure, occurs directly through the membrane. It's not through any sort of protein. The molecule will cross directly through the membrane down its concentration rate. We're calling it simple diffusion. Diffusion is a form of passive transport in which we have molecules moving in a pervading way from high concentration to low concentration. And it's simple because it doesn't require any, any additional uh, uh, proteins or anything like that. It's just directly through the membrane. When the molecule that is undergoing simple diffusion is water, we use a special term to describe this passive transport simple diffusion mechanism. We call that osmosis. So this is just simply a special form of diffusion. It's called osmosis. In terms of osmosis, we can define how a water molecule will move based off of concentration gradients of water. But we usually don't refer to the water concentration gradient specifically. We refer to a solute and the solute's concentration gradient by terms of tonicity. So rather than it being the concentration of water, it's really the concentration of solutes that will define how much water is available within each of those compartments, the intercellular fluid, extracellular fluid, to allow the movement of water and to form the water's concentration gradient. Because you see, water is matter, and it has mass, and it takes up space, and so are solutes. Solutes are matter, they have mass, and they take up space. If a solute takes up space, that means there's less room for water in that particular solution or compartment. So as we add more salt into a 
container of water, we're actually losing room for the water because the salt is taking up that space. So when we look at the biological system, we really have to keep track of two different solutions. Those solutions are going to be the intracellular fluid, which I will always abbreviate as the ICF, and then the extracellular fluid that I will abbreviate ECF. So imagine that I have a barrier, and I have my extracellular fluid on one side, and my intracellular fluid on the other. And in that fluid, I have some solute. It doesn't matter what the solute is, but let's call it sodium, just for sake of argument. So more sodium than the extracellular fluid side, less sodium in the intracellular fluid side. What that means in terms of water, I'm going to draw it in blue, is that I don't have as much room. Make bigger so you can maybe see it. I don't have as much room for my water. Whereas over here, I have far more room for my water. Okay? So now, looking at these two fluids, these two different solutions, I can begin to define the tonicity and figure out how the water is going to move across this membrane. When I have a high concentration solution, surrounding a cell, and usually in tendency we're looking at a reference solution, which is going to be the solution that we want to know uh, how the movement is going to occur. So in terms of biology, our reference solution is always inside of the cell. When we take that reference solution and put it into a high concentration solution, so I take a cell and I put it into a high concentration solution, so there is lots of solute, that means less water. Lots of solute, another way to say that, lots is hyper, and solute is ton. So this high concentration solution, when it surrounds a cell, we call that a hyper tonic solution. Hypertonic means high solute. Whenever you have high sol solute, you have to have lower water. Because the large amount of solutes are taking up the space that could normally be taken up by water, so it's lower amount of water. The other option is that the solution surrounding our reference could be lower concentration. So there is more solute inside of the cell compared to that solution outside of the cell. So it's a lower concentration solution outside of the cell. We call that a hypotonic solution. This means more water because hypotonic means less hypotonic solution, less or solute rather than solution. So a lower solute solution, you may need more room for water. And then finally we have one last option and that's for the solutions to be equal concentration. And we're going to call those isotonic. Same solute, meaning same amount of uh, water or same concentration of water. And so we don't have any favoring concentration gradients. So we're going to have movement, but the movement's going to be balanced out. So there's going to be no net change. So just real quick, just to try to hopefully solidify this just a little bit. If I have three different containers and I put in a cell in each of these containers, fill them up with some water, and fill them up with some particles that we'll draw here in red. different types of solutions, right? So the terms hypertonic, hypotonic, isotonic refers to the solution, but 
in reference to what is going on inside of the cell. Right? So over here, I have a higher number of particles. You can count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight particles outside of the cell, three particles inside of the cell. What type of solution is outside of the cell? Okay, so it's more solutes. Translate that to the Latin, hypertonic. So this is my hypertonic, which means hyper high tonic solute. So inside, um, or I'm sorry, we would have low amount of water outside of the cell compared to the inside of the cell. So if I were to draw in here my water concentration gradient based off of the hypertonic solution, I know there's less water here, there's more water here. How will water move in this situation? Outside, or from uh, inside the cell to the outside of the cell. Moves in that direction. What will happen to that cell? It'll begin to shrink. Okay, so I got one, two, three, four, five particles in this figure on the outside, and then a, a buttload, is that fair to say? <laughs> on the inside of the cell. So, what kind of solution is this? So, it's going to be a low solute solution, hypotonic, and that means low solute, high water. So we got a lot of water out here, but not as much water in here. How is the water going to move? So it goes into this, and it's just the water, right? It's not the solution complete. It's, it's only the water that's moving. That's going to cause the cell to get bigger and uh, break apart, which is called um, lice. Yeah, lice. Um, if it's a red blood cell, we call it hemolysis. The last one, three and three, so it's equal, isotonic. That means that there's no difference in the solute, no difference in the water, and there's no net movement of water. So we're not going to see an increase or a decrease in the size of that cell. Okay? Now, as this happens, and we change the tonicity of your blood or your extracellular fluids surrounding the cells, the effect on the cell is for the water to move into and out of the cell. In eukaryotic cells, like mammalian cells, that are just the cell membrane, the cell shrinks and it can actually break apart in a uh, process called plasmolysis, or it can expand and break apart in a just a process called lysis uh, or it's very blood cell hemolysis. When we add in the cell wall, this changes the water effects. So tonicity with cell walls, it's going to change it just a little bit. The cell wall is actually going to begin to exert pressure. So if the cell wall begins to exert pressure, so here's another experiment. Got my Solutes there. And I got my solutes inside and outside. All right, so in this situation, what is my tonicity of my solution? I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, so it's hypertonic. Nine here, three here. Okay. 
by the way, I also was going to be drawing the cell membrane, right? Because I just got the cell wall. There's the cell membrane. Okay, so it's hypertonic. So that means high water. Uh, I'm sorry, high solute, rather. And then that means low water. So it's low water here, higher water here. So water begins to leak. Okay? The cell wall provides structure here and actually pulls back on pulls back on the uh, on the membrane. And so there's going to be some force there. What about the other situation? Where we have a beaker, our cell, water, and now water. Now what do I have? I have a hypotonic solution. Low solute, high water. High water outside the cell, low water inside the cell. So now what's going to happen? So water rushes in. However, I now have a rigid structure around that cell. So as the water begins to flow in, I actually have a structure that's pushing back on the cell. So as that cell expands, it doesn't have as much room to expand. Pressure and volume are inversely related. I am keeping the volume of the entire cell of that within that cell wall constant. And so as I fill that cell wall up with more and more solution, that cell wall begins to push back on the uh, cell itself in the membrane. So not only is the water moving in, but I got this effect of pressure. These are those arrows there. These are this is the pressure of the cell wall pushing back on the cell itself. Now as that happens, there's going to be a competition between the water coming in and that pressure. And eventually they're going to balance themselves out. And I'm going to get to a point where even though I have a water concentration gradient favoring the movement of water into the cell, that exertional pressure is pushing the water, forcing the water back out, or has force in such a way that it prevents water from moving in. So because the cell wall exerts pressure, I may be able to override the concentration gradient. So the concentration gradient may be overridden. And what that means is despite there being a concentration gradient that favors the flow of water into the cell, I can oppose that water movement because of the exertional pressure of the cell wall. And that's called turgidity. When a cell is turgid or firm, because of the exertional pressure, it basically only allows that cell to get so, so large. It doesn't allow it to get so large that it breaks apart. So it keeps it turgid or firm. Whereas a cell without the cell wall, it would just continue to blow up until it burst. Okay? So the cell wall is actually somewhat protective when you have large changes in the tonicity of the solution surrounding that cell, prevents it from, it just allows it to get firm, turgid, not to go through that lysing process. The other example that I gave, you can see that. The cell wall is not going to prevent it from getting too big. We're actually shrinking out. The cell wall adheres to the cell membrane. And so as it shrinks, 
it's kind of pulling, or so well not sort of pulling on the uh, cell membrane. And in that hypotonic situation, as the water leaks out of the cell, it causes that to shrink. This is lethal for plant cells and other cells that have cell walls. It's called plasmolysis. So that's all related to this idea of simple diffusion, diffusing materials through the cell membrane. When it's done in reference to a cell wall, we have that exertional pressure changes it just a little bit. We get turgidity or firmness rather than the, the homolysis or the, the um, cytolysis, the breaking up of the Okay, so we have simple diffusion and osmosis. The next simple um, or passive transport mechanism that we have is facilitated diffusion. So whenever you see diffusion, you should always be thinking in terms of passive transport utilizing the concentration rate. In this case, this is facilitated as opposed to simple diffusion. Simple diffusion was right through the, mem uh, the membrane, no uh, need for uh, proteins or anything like that. Now we're going to need proteins to facilitate the diffusion. We're going to need something else to help the diffusion occur. That's called facilitated diffusion. So facilitated diffusion, the protein helps the solute cross. The solute is still going to follow the high concentration to low concentration convention. So we're still going to be utilizing the concentration gradient rather than using ATP in energy. Facilitated just simply means that diffusion is now occurring through a protein that facilitates the process. Okay, does that make sense? This is a good place to stop. I'll let you guys get out just a couple of minutes early, four minutes early. Enjoy your fall break. I hope you all are safe. When we come back next week, we will, um, or after the break, talk about um, active transport.